If you have your uh, Bibles, you can uh, turn with me to the book of Acts, if you're already there. Acts chapter 18. Many of you have heard of the name Will Rogers. Will Rogers was a one of the, probably one of the greatest political sages in American history. Uh, he died in 1935 in a plane crash uh, with a friend, with his best friend. Uh, but the country uh, knew him for his witty remarks and his words, like he said, "Never slap a man who's chewing tobacco." <laughs> Always, uh, always drink upstream from the herd. You know, think about that one, okay. But it was interesting what he said as he got older, what he said about older people. Eventually, you will reach a point where you stop lying about your age and start bragging about it. Mm-hmm. And the older we get, the fewer things seem worth waiting in line for. All right. Uh, and when you are dissatisfied, when you are dissatisfied with your life now as an older person and you're thinking about, boy, it would be great to go back and be a young person again, he says, think of algebra. You remember what it was like when you were a teenager doing algebra? Mm-hmm. Okay. The Apostle Paul has met a couple and he is traveling now and he's in the city of Corinth. He has arrived, he's a stranger in this town, and as he wanders through these streets, he's weighed down by all of what he sees and the sinfulness of Corinth. And also he's asking questions practically. Where is he going to stay? Where is he going to work? Where Are there the Lord's people here in this town? I mean, there is a, uh, the Jewish uh, people that are there. And uh, what would he do in this great metropolis city? So the, and soon um, the Lord leads him to a couple who would open up their home to him. And their meeting would begin in a special relationship in years to follow. We will see that Paul uh, will value these two dear friends and lifelong partners in the ministry. And they would also become some of the most beloved people that you will find in the early church, especially in the book of Acts. And through their, though their names appear only in a few pages of scripture, they made a lasting impact on the lives of numerous people throughout uh, the early church time period. On one occasion in Romans chapter 16, he said, they risked their lives for me, uh, not only for me, but also for the churches. We don't know exactly what Paul is referring to. Uh, we see the great affection and attitude and gratitude that he has. Uh, and the churches also are, are very have gratitude for uh, this couple also because they are choice servants of the Lord. And so Aquila and his... So Aquila and his uh, wife Priscilla came to Corinth. As verse 2 of chapter 18 says, they came because of the emperor. The emperor has now told all of the Jews to leave Rome, and so they are now moving uh, uh, over onto the next peninsula in Greece, and they go to this city. They're originally from, they're originally from Pontus. A, uh, Pontus is a province sort of in the northern Asia, which uh, Turkey today, northern Turkey near the Black Sea. And they were tent makers, and they worked in tents and sails and probably leather goods there in Corinth. And Luke tells us in verse 2 and 3 that Paul went to see them. Uh, I think probably started out from the Jewish perspective, and then he saw what they were doing and said also that he was a tent maker. And with that, they began to work together. It was, wasn't long before their, their working together was more than just business partners in terms of what they were making, but also they were co-laborers together with Paul for the Lord. So we see that the way that begins in looking at this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, is that number one is that on the back of your bulletin, our first glimpse is that we see them opening their home. They are willing to open their home to a stranger. And this scene uh, would have become very, that, that, that idea would become very familiar in what Quill and Priscilla do. A great many people discovered the place to find hospitality and fellowship was to go to the house of Aquila and Priscilla. 
And the expression that is most frequently used in, in terms of talking about Aquila and Priscilla, the term that's used right after that is the church that meets at their house. Now, the scriptures paint us a picture of them repeatedly using their home as a way to minister to other people. Remember what it's like to be a newcomer. Remember what it's like in school, whether it's in school, whether it's in a job, or whether it's in a church. Uh, I've done all of those, uh, especially uh, in school being a PK and moving around a little bit with uh, my dad in different churches. But uh, it was interesting for Marlene and I, we were in a church one Sunday. It was a church that we were not familiar with, and, and, uh, and it was interesting to be a stranger there. And uh, it's interesting who you meet. Oh, this is your first time here? Well, this is my first time. So you meet other strangers. Okay. And uh, aren't you glad you came? You know, and uh, do you ever feel like a stranger in a crowd? Well, here is this aspect of being feeling of being, uh, being welcomed. Uh, by the way, as, as a pastor, I am always appreciative when I have gone and visited families uh, that have visited our church and they say, well, did you feel welcome? And um, I don't think I've ever heard a sour note. It's always been interesting to hear people say, man, your church was very welcoming, very cordial, very kind. And, and uh, it's very easy in our day when many people want to just basically sort of seclude themselves in privacy, and, and uh, especially even with the COVID thing and all that's going on, uh, the sort of COVID stop us from uh, showing hospitality. And uh, it doesn't need to be, uh, uh, you know, some people, you know, whether they take somebody out for lunch or whatever, um, even just using paper plates in your own house and inviting people over to show uh, the love of Christ. And uh, as I was prepping for the sermon, it, it, I was reminded of a program that we did. I can't remember which church it was, but uh, we did what was called soup and salad. And there was a group of people that were, a group of people in the church that were ready for the first Sunday of the month. There was another group of people that were ready for the second Sunday of the month. There was another group for the third Sunday and another group for the fourth Sunday. And then I think the fifth Sunday was Marley and me. Uh, but it was the opportunity for, they had like two or three couples. And what they would do is that on that Sunday that they were on is that they would look for people in the church, and especially newcomers. And uh, I remember one family, they came the whole month, and they were new all four Sundays, and they got invited to four different homes. Um, and it, it was a way to just, and soup and salad, so you, you know, you just pour soup in a bowl, and, and uh, salad, you know, and soup's getting a little low, you just add a little water. I don't know, I don't know, so but you guys understand this stuff. But uh, just a great way to show hospitality of people coming to church. Our homes can provide a natural setting for encouragement. And uh, the scriptures tell us, remember, practice hospitality. Don't forget to entertain strangers. Uh, only the Lord knows the number of people uh, who experience that Christian warmth and love that Aquila and Priscilla provided. And Paul was among them. So. The second thing we see here is that Aquila and Priscilla became such a valuable asset to Paul when he decided to leave Corinth and he was going to go uh, to another place uh, that he asked them to go with him. And so they set sail for across the Aegean Sea, and they went over to the province of Asia, and there uh, they go to the city of Ephesus. And after spending a very short time there, Paul goes journeys on. He leaves Ephesus, verses 21 and 22, to go to Antioch and Jerusalem uh, because he's there to report what the Lord had been doing. And upon, uh, upon Paul's departure, here is this now faithful couple who continue to keep uh, the, uh, this church uh, 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 continuing on. And in Paul's absence, they oversee the ministry that is taking place in Ephesus, uh, or in Ephesians. Uh, and following one of the most uh, important churches that will come out of this is the church of Ephesus and Ephesians, because this, there is a book called Ephesians, there is a mention of Ephesus and Revelation, and so this church will be a very important part uh, in the New Testament. In other words, they faithfully took on the responsibility of continuing to see uh, what God was doing for you. And by the way, it also freed Paul up for other things that he would do. In fact, it would allow him to continue on in his third missionary journey. 
And so their support of ministry freed up what he was able to then do. Uh, who do we know that you would like to help us alleviate so that they can be more effective in ministry? What can I do to help you this week? Maybe that's a good question to ask. Uh, what things are keeping you from doing what you need to do? Uh, in other words, uh, any person who is in ministry to have people who want to help and who take the initiative to fill a need. And it's wonderful to even with Anna and I, or with Priscilla and Quilla, is that they begin to see ahead and they anticipate what is needed. Uh, hey, you know, there's a thing over here that has to be done. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of it. This needs fixes. Don't worry. We'll take care. Someone may need to, need to fill it in this pocket. Don't worry. We'll, we'll take care of it. And um, I feel like for so with that kind of persons who wanted to help and they assumed responsibility. They took the initiative in ministering to help Paul and others that were ministering. And what a delight it has been for the apostle to, to have to be fortunate enough to have this kind of uh, these kind of folks in his in his flock and in his church. Number three is that verse 24. While they are overseeing the works of Ephesus, there's a guy that shows up, a guy who arrives in the city, he's a gifted teacher, his name is Apollos. And Apollos is a native of Alexandria. Alexandria is Egypt area. And uh, we see that he is described here with passages of what he is like. He is one who has thorough knowledge of the scriptures. And he had been instructed in verse 25 in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor, and he talked about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, this dynamic teacher began to make a significant impact on the city there, and when Paul and Priscilla heard him teach, they soon discovered that what was taking place is that he did not fully, he was not fully informed about all the things the Lord and what the Lord has, uh, has accomplished. In other words, he is proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, which is exactly what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist said, In other words, that was the promise. But John the Baptist never saw the fulfillment. And in some ways, that's what the fact of Apollos is that Apollos had heard the promise, but in many ways, he had never heard about the fulfillment. In other words, he did not know about the cross. He did not know about Christ and his death. And he did not know about the empty tomb and the resurrection. And so I think that is a part of you know, what uh, Priscilla and Pula did here is that they heard this and then they invited him home. Uh, now what should they do? Verse 26. Priscilla and Pula heard him and they invited him home explaining him the way of God more adequately. Nicola must have been very gracious with a gentle spirit. Uh, preacher, we need to inform you a little bit more. Yeah. I don't know if I had one of those meetings. I don't know. But um, uh, in other words, he's, he, here's a guy who's minding the scriptures. And by the way, I think Apollos was a guy who was very humble, very teachable spirit to listen to that. And uh, I think that that's a wonderful thing that takes place here uh, in their home. And with that, Apollos now has a greater message to give. And he uses, uh, again, the use of the setting of their home, sitting in their home and, and sharing this together. Uh, it was a help to the personal ministry of Apollos and what was taking place as he wanted to continue to be a servant of the Lord. Now, they didn't stop there. Soon this uh, gifted orator was eager to cross the Aegean. He was now wanting to go and to go to Achaia. Achaia is basically Greece. And he wanted to go to the city of Corinth. And we see verse 27, the, uh, the brothers there encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there in Corinth to welcome them. And having spent so much time in Corinth with Paul, uh, Aquila and Priscilla were familiar with Corinth and, and the needs of the church there. And they were undoubtedly, I think, involved in, in preparing the way for Apollos to go to Corinth. They probably provided letters of introduction, probably some personal contacts, maybe some encouragement, and they continued to equip him with whatever he needed for a successful ministry. And uh, by the way, how effective was he? We'll look at verse 
verse 27, because the Luke writes it down, and the writing is great, help for those by grace who had belief, and the biggest thing the of the Jews in public debate, proof from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus was the Christ. Gifted leaders are called to prepare God's people for works of service, and many a pastor or ministry leader feels overwhelmed by the task. It's great to have those lay persons who are willing to help and be a part in that church and disciple. And what a delight it is to have others who share their vision and invest their gifts. What a joy to serve as part of a ministry team like uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila uh, were an important part of the ministry. They faithfully ministered to those around them. At the same time, they sought to make others on the team more effective, like Paul, like Apollos. It's interesting, Paul will write about this in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, I planted the seed, and Apollos watered it, but God brought the increase. And one of the reasons for such a fruitful ministry in Corinth was the faithful, I think, behind-the-scenes ministry of this couple. Who do you know that would benefit from something like that? Just to be encouraged, just to be prayed for. I think you have in your bulletin there when you think about the Luke family and what they're doing. But it's wonderful to know as they have written to us to say thank you. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for encouraging us now that we're uh, not physically on the field. But, uh, it's always a question of what, in what ways can you help? Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's starting a, a small group by study. Maybe it's in your own uh, community. Maybe it's going out with someone for a lunch or, or asking them, uh, uh, maybe it's asking someone to join you to go visit someone. Uh, I just uh, was talking with a man from a former church and we did that. We would go out and visit people that had come to church and uh, I think we did that for five years. And, and uh, it, it was an opportunity that he, he, he was, he's telling me about it, well, I miss those times. And it was the aspect of just being equipped to learn how to go up to a door and to talk to someone. Uh, and he loved that. He loved the aspect of just uh, evangelizing people there in the doorway and talking with them. But uh, where are those open doors that you see that you can use? The last thing we see is number four is providing support. Uh, go to uh, 2 Timothy. Paul is, is in prison in Rome uh, and awaiting his trial before Caesar and eventually will be his execution. And he writes these final words to his protege, his young protege named Timothy. And here in the second letter to Timothy, uh, he writes to his dear son who is in the faith and Timothy is pastoring the church in Ephesus. In Ephesus. And uh, he is carrying on this ministry in this church. And there are several references in the letter that basically talk about how difficult it is. And Paul is writing to this young pastor, Timothy, and he says, Be strong. Endure hardship. Be on your guard. Uh, because there are people that are there and that would be opposing him. And so here is this young timid Timothy encountering the struggles of the ministry there. And how would he overcome the difficulties and the discouragements that he faced? Who could Paul count on for encouragement there? And from the prison cell in Rome, he records these words to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 19. He says, Greet Priscilla, and quote. And these uh, choice servants of the Lord had returned to Ephesus, and they were serving alongside Timothy, providing support to make his ministry more effective. And what an encouragement that must have been for Timothy, and what an encouragement that was for Paul, who's sitting in the prison, to know that here are seasoned servants of God who were there laboring alongside his son in the faith. And that they were there to help. This uh, book, First and Second Timothy, uh, came home to me um, when I was a young pastor in my first church. And uh, this passage in uh, First Timothy four was shown to me by a couple in my first church, and because I was feeling discouraged. And 
was discouraging about the aspect of, um, especially as a young minister, when you're raw and you're new and you're thinking about all of these older believers that are there in the church who have been there for 20, 30, 40 years, you know, and then you as this young whatever. And, um, and I, it, 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 uh, it wore on me. And it was interesting that I told that to this couple, and they pulled out the passage in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, that says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But be an example. I, I needed that. And uh, whenever Aquila and Priscilla went, they were people that, like that couple in my church, that ministered to other people. In other words, a change in address did not affect their commitment to serving the Lord. They provided support. Uh, we live in a time when many are shopping for church to meet their needs. How often is it that we run into people that come in and say, is there a place where I can serve in your church? Like a quote, like you said. Well, I started with a storyteller. Let me end with a story. In a remote region of India, there were four men who were hurriedly driving a tractor down a winding mountain road. And they were going down to the valley below to get supplies to bring back to their village. In that time frame, in a quick flash, the tractor tipped over, killing one man and injuring two others. The incident created an uproar in that community, and the driver was thrown into prison. The question was, would he have to pay for his mistake? In this very nomadic people group in India, they are very illiterate, meaning they can't read. And as a result, they almost exclusively communicate orally, verbally. The religious beliefs and traditions in that area are passed on by word of mouth. And they're passed on through stories or through songs. If you've got a song that you know, tells you what your faith is, you ready to sing? Or do you have a story? You know, it's interesting with our, our uh, people not going to church anymore is that we're going to grow up with people that don't even know what, hey, that's a real David and Goliath story. And they'll look at you and say, who is that? And, uh, or that guy reminds me of a Samson. Okay, what's that? In other words, those stories that are so familiar to us are becoming unfamiliar in our culture. Solving the dilemma here, they, what they did is that they decided that there would have to be a lot of discussion. Since we don't write things down, we talk. And so they put a council together and they brought three influential brothers of the village together to be a part of this council. The youngest of the brothers is a guy named Abraham. Abraham had been learning to tell Bible stories, even though his family's faith is not Christian. And over the past year, Abraham had learned to tell 40 different Bible stories. Now all of you are good, you're ready to go with 40, right? Um, though he was not a committed follower of Christ. But he saw there was great value in telling the stories, and the stories began to have an influence upon his outlook, and he began to change. In fact, his wife even said, he treats me much better and with more respect because of what these stories are doing. As the men met to discuss the incident, Abraham spoke up and he told the story from Matthew 18. You're all familiar with Matthew 18, what the story is? Where Jesus teaches about forgiving your brother, how many times? 70 times seven? And especially, uh, you know, uh, where, where, where one guy has been forgiven and then he goes outside and he's unwilling to forgive somebody else. And um, though Abraham isn't literate in terms of being able to read this, 
His retelling of the story is completely accurate. The men listened to his words as he spoke, and in turn, in the, in the aspect of forgiveness, and in turn, they decided to forgive the tractor driver. He was free from prison, and also there was no financial restitution that he had to make. This is a village that previously did not have the opportunity to understand scripture. These people are starting to hear the word of God in a way that they can understand. They understand it through the stories that are told. And especially helps this small group of nomadic believers and then their worldview begins to broaden as they begin to understand what God is doing. And they are seeing as a God who forgives and then also how that we are to be forgiving toward others and a completely different understanding for them. Because of the story, that was shared by someone with them. Whenever we find an Aquila and Priscilla in the New Testament, we see ordinary people who are willing to share and share their great commitment to the Lord and truly that they are people that are servants at heart. And their ministry had an impact for Christ and his kingdom. And like-minded individuals and couples today are needed in that same framework, just like what they were doing back then. People willing to invest their lives to help make others more effective servants, to be a part of Jesus and his kingdom. By his grace, what does he want you to do in terms of ministry? Like Aquila and Priscilla? And a good question to ask is, where has he placed you? What does he want you to do? Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we are mindful that uh, you have created us for good works. And Lord, uh, it is wonderful to see these choice servants of God that are seen here in this passage in the book of Acts that Paul had the opportunity to run into and learn and, uh, and then also to teach. And with that, to see this couple just expand from there. Lord, we are mindful that we have a wonderful story that is given to us in Christ. May that be our desire also, to be of help to one another, to use whatever you have given to us, whether it's our car, whether it's our home, whether it's our knowledge, that we can share and encourage somebody else. Use this to your glory, because we are so thankful for a Savior who is willing to give himself for us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name.